unleash the beast. When we released the LS600D Pro, we took the entire industry by storm. As our flagship daylight unit, the 600D Pro led the lighting world with an output of 8,500 lux at three meters, scaling up to a staggering 29,300 lux with the F10 Fresnel. Combined with advanced wireless control and numerous battery capabilities, the 600D Pro became the standard for LED power. But standards were meant to be broken. And as the saying here at Aperture goes, the best can always be brighter. Introducing the new Daylight Challenger, the Lightstorm 1200D Pro. Weighing in under 20 pounds, its 1200 watt output hits heavy at 22,400 lux at three meters. And when you're punching in more narrow, the fixture unleashes an astronomical 83,100 lux at three meters, on par with the Joker 1600 and raising the bar for LED innovation. With a max power draw of only 1,440 watts, this unit can live safely on household power. And as it harnesses the power of the sun, the 1200D Pro stays on the same wavelength when it comes to color, reproducing a high TLCI value of 98 and D56 SSI of 73. With a feature set and rugged framework designed for professionals, the 1200D Pro rewrites what modern filmmakers expect out of quality lighting today. First comes the build quality. The 1200D Pro features our most weather-tight construction to date, with its heavy-duty IP54 construction shielding it from any rain and dust. Its curved yoke, 360-degree tilt, and durable 7.5-meter head cable make it easy to rig when it's required to fly sky-high. Along with its protective rolling case, we've added another to house three new optimized reflectors for the 1200. Narrow, wide, and medium. One to maximize output, one to illuminate large areas, and one for everything in between. And to match the robust lamp head, we've packed the control box with professional filmmaking tools. Adjust the unit in 0.1% increments with zero color shift in between. In addition to wired DMX512, ArtNet, and SACN connectivity, the 1200D Pro also features wireless control using the industry standard Lumen Radio CRMX protocol, and of course, CytusLink. CytusLink mixes professional tools with ease of use because fast connectivity and access to all your other aperture lights and effects are the difference in making your day. And with lead follow mode, you can make one 1200D Pro control many. The 1200D Pro's dual 48 volt DC inputs allow you to use power stations and block batteries for any job on the go powering the fixture up to half or full power so you can take the sunlight with you. It comes standard with eight built-in lighting effects, including strobe, explosion, and TV, as well as the standard for all Aperture Lightstorm lights, the universal Bowens mount. As the brightest Bowens mount fixture on the market, you can shape your lighting with a variety of accessories, like the Light Dome 150, Lantern 90, or the F10 Fresnel or even the latest addition to the family. Introducing the Light Octodome 120. Our latest modifier is an eight-sided softbox that spans 1.2 meters, producing stunningly beautiful catch lights with every subject you capture. The Octodome 120 comes with 1.5 and 2.5 stop diffusion fabrics, as well as a 45 degree light control grid and at nearly the same weight as a 4x4 diffusion frame, it ties everything you love about these industry classics together with elegant reflections, portability, and single unit operation. 
We've also made the unit compatible with third-party accessories you know and love. Together, the 1200D Pro truly becomes the one light to rule them all. For most filmmakers, it wasn't possible to achieve this much output on a household circuit. And now, we've made that a thing of the past. At Aperture, bridging technology with the needs of modern filmmakers is what we do, because the challenge of storytelling is hard enough. You need to work fast and get the shot just right. So wouldn't it be nice if all you needed to say is bring in the sun? This is such a common thing in product. People want to take something cheap and make it look really expensive. Yeah, we've lit this shoot so far with pretty much two lights. We're so. just basically running the smoke and we're gonna run it right over the coffee beans right as we pull the camera back. It's just like playing Call of Duty, right? <laughs> oh, we got something! <laughs> hey, wait, that wasn't the worst ever. That wasn't the worst ever. Okay. Filmmaking 101. All right, Brandon, uh, this is new. We're not in the studio. I have a bag of coffee in my hands. <laughs> what are we doing? Well, today we're here to meet Nate Fu, the owner of Miss Robot, and he is a product cinematographer who specializes in motion control cinematography. Yeah, and of course, we have the 1200D with us because rather than walking you through all the little details about the 1200D, we'd rather show you how a professional cinematographer like him puts it into practice. We're gonna use the 1200D and all of that punch to really take advantage of it for shooting very specific things like high speed, something that's really dark like these coffee beans, and some macro cinematography, which takes up a lot of light. There's a lot of practices that a real professional product cinematographer uses that can be applied into the indie style filmmaking. Because obviously, we're gonna be talking about camera movement, we're gonna be talking about where you place your light, every little thing that a professional does that just takes a little bit of know-how to make work with like a DSLR and a one light system. Hey, sounds good. Sounds like the perfect day for the using the 1200D Pro. Let's yeah. get to it. Welcome. Andy, welcome. how you doing? Doing good, welcome. Well, let's go see the studio. Yeah. And then over here, it looks like we have the most organized studio I have ever seen. <laughs> Everything is on nice IKEA shelves. Everything is like in its own little container and all these little stickers. So it begs the question, why does the cinematographer in your line of work need to have all these tools at your disposal and why do you need to keep them this organized in this fashion? I think I, I really like to, like flow state is pretty important for me. And like when you're trying to make something and you can't find what you want, it can make you really frustrated. Like here's the odd bin. This is just like plastic trash. You know like when you like, this is uh, like from the Ikea shelf. From right? Ikea, yeah. this is literally from Ikea. But like then you kind of find like, oh, one day you need like to hold up a little corner. So I kind of just take like the trash of stuff and I kind of collect, you never know. So we talked a lot about your studio and your studio is amazing, but ultimately we came here for you. So tell us a little bit more about yourself, why you got into product cinematography, a little about your background. Um, what do you want to let the audience know? I was like really drawn to like the 3D feel of it or like almost like the digital feel of it. Mm -hmm. Like cinematography was like in the past a lot about creating our own perspective. And now it was like we have all of this like generative visual language, like computer visual language or like internet visual language and like user interface and UX and UI, right, that are driving the visual language. Mm -hmm. It makes you think a little bit more like a graphic designer. It feels like you're composing a frame digitally, you're nudging things you're centering them and you're like, oh, let's do it again, but like, let's get a little more center aligned. And almost like how you're thinking about like web and like, like graphic design, much mm -hmm. more than like cinematography. Ultimately, I wanna ask you about how product cinematography can still tell a story. Uh, and for that, I have this. I've been holding it the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanna hand this off to you and ask you, how do you think we should tell the story about uh, a coffee grinder? There's not like a character arc. Exactly. Right, in like, a grinder. We're not going to follow a character, we're not going to fall in love. So I think it's more about tone. Like, what does this, what does this place feel like if I were there? We can think about a coffee grinder in the morning on your countertop, you know, and the sun kind of hits it. So instead of following the character off of coffee, it's basically about setting a tone using all our elements to evoke an emotion out of the viewer. I know there's this hero shot where we see the product. You know, this might be at the end of the video, it could be at the beginning, um, and this there's a reveal. And I know that there are these features they want to show off. 
you know, there is like a dial, there is a grind setting, there is a hopper, there's a, a couple different like features they want to show off because they're proud that they made it this way and they thought about how the users might use it. Um, and then there's this texture, like the care that was put into making this, the materials that they chose, and they want to show that off. So I kind of break it down into like thinking of like, yeah, the product here as a whole, some of it's how it's, how we might show off its features and like the textures involved. That brings into question, today is your playground. How are you going to show off the texture of these coffee beans? It's okay, it's still wrapped in plastic, no worries. Oh man. Okay, so this is like, this is challenging. Like if I had to shoot this, oh, this is tricky. Um, this is such a common thing in product. Mm -hmm. People want to take something cheap and make it look really expensive. Yeah. And I think this is tricky. Yeah. Um, it's, it's doable. It would be interesting. Dude, honestly, I just need to see this on camera real quick. First you rough in the shot, like we did here. We can see that it's roughly center. What's your next step in the process? Either I'll start building the moves, I'll mm -hmm. start designing the movements, and then we're gonna kind of feel it. Next step is like figure out the tone of it. Mm -hmm. Like what does this thing feel like? Where are we at? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. If you don't realize what this is, everyone, he basically mounted a 20 by solid to a hoist. <laughs> is controlling it with a Mathalini. <laughs> this is beautiful. I love it. I took this on a chain and I just bought this on like McMaster car and they just bought a chain for it. Sometimes you just need the simplest solution. You don't need to get big drapes or big robotic curtains that are gonna cost you thousands of dollars. Just get a 20 by solid and just roll it down. Let's yeah, just so rough in some stuff. Yeah, um, we're gonna start by roughing in the light a little bit just so we can kind of start getting the, a feel for what we're creating. And here we have a 300X in a spotlight mount. Try and get some more of those warmer tones in here first and give us that flexibility if we wanna keep it warm or if we wanna need to cool it down. Yeah, we're just gonna cut some light, make some sunlight vibes. Should feel like it's coming through like a window, right? Sure, yeah. I'm gonna rough this in, see if it looks decent. Like, imagine there was like some foliage yeah. on like a piece of it. Let's see. That's where you feel like this is sunlight coming in through a window because it's uh, casting some shadows on some leaves off some trees. So you have 3,800 Kelvin right now, this is at 37, so right now we're white. Yeah, I'm just kind of matching tones. The way I want to use this 1200 is I want to use it as if it's the sky. And I want to like play it a little blue even. Yeah, the 1200D Pro can be basically the light that you get after it comes in through the awning, has bounced off a bunch of things, a little cooler, just like an overcast sky. Yeah. Okay, so the next challenge, arguably the bigger challenge in setting up the frame, is how to set this up without touching the branch right. or the robot. Let me try something. My gut, like, and this is actually something I probably could only do with the 1200, is like, you're gonna lose so much light. So we're double breaking the light right now, and basically when you're double breaking, you wanna start out with a smaller diffuse source, closer to your unit, and then diffuse it into a larger source. I'm gonna center it up, so I'm gonna arc over, and then it looks like we need to be just a hair over. I'm gonna take this little guy. I'm just gonna make two marks. It's weird, it's like you're like nudging pixels. You know, it's kind of like what I was saying with graphic design. Yeah. It just kind of like... Because oh, can, you can't afford to be that precise. It's not like on a tripod where you're just like, oh, you panned a little too far. Can I show them something that I think is actually quite cool? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna loop it, robot moves, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll it, and I'm just gonna change the lighting as we go. I'm, what I'm basically gonna do is give them different looks. So, so like 100, this, 80, yeah, 60. 100, yeah. And it's just looping. And so the faster I can change this, I can give them like a pile of new looks. So this is the 100 look. I'm gonna give them the high contrast look. And then I'm gonna give them the 20% look. And this way you can just cycle through everything uh, in pretty much like two yep. minutes. Camera cuts. Oops, wrong cut. <laughs> <laughs> Not the rolling button. <laughs> That's how I would probably use the mm -hmm. cycle because then I don't have to argue about which exposure. I just did all, all of them. I'm learning how to use this way <laughs> as we go. You know, it didn't occur to you that you could just be like, oh, I could just do six different looks right now in two minutes. Exactly. And so then once I realized that, well, just, well then let's mm -hmm. just loop it and get all six. And then we wouldn't even have had the discussion about which one to pick. Yeah. We just roll all five, you know? Fix it in post is what he's saying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get it off my plate. Once it's out of the studio, I don't have to worry about it. Yep. Robot moves in three, two, one, action. Cool. Here we go. Um, Cut. We could get the grind on another shot. 
Let's cut. Filmmaking. <laughs> yeah, we don't need the grind. You, you set that up, and we'll work on the next shot. We'll <laughs> I mean, we are up here. We could do the top-down top one, pushing in with the beans falling in now. Mm -hmm. Go back to the beginning of our shot list. So wait, how slow do we want it? So basically, because we're at 160 frames per second instead of 120, that's, what is that? A little over five, that's six times as fast. So it just means six times less light. Roughly two and two thirds stops, two and a half stops of light that we need to gain back. But that means if we basically open up to theoretically from 14, that's two thirds to 11, then to eight, and then to 5.6. Yeah. That's a 5.6? That's 5.6. That's five, six. I mean, that's mathematically what it's supposed to be, ah, whether but, it's- Oh, wait, wait, hold on. This is a fun lesson. Mathematically correct. Exactly, but it's not always perfect. When you shoot macro, uh -huh. you have an exposure compensation. Oh, so yeah. at 10 inches, I'm losing, not that much. I'm losing just a half stop. Okay. But at seven inches, I'm losing a stop and a third. Because as you're moving closer, basically the whole element system is moving forward and is closing your actual amount of available light. So I just ignore gaffers all the time. And I just like, I'm just going on the monitor. I yeah. don't care because- as as it looks right to you. Okay, um, and then we, I feel like it's hot on the table. Yeah, on the bottom corner. Yeah, just an exposure thing or do we want to cut the bottom of that? I think you probably do need a net because you need more. Oh, you no, need no, no, more. no net, no net. We're going to use, we're going to use organic nets. Oh, Forget we're going to use the branches. No, no nets like that. No, nets are not real. Forget that. We Nets are not stuff. real. But you see like what I, what's happening here? Yeah, I know you mean. Like, it's breaking it's like, it up so that it's actually absorbing some of that light. Yeah. And, and it's allowing us to focus the same amount of output here. You know, just put some beans in all the hot areas. The beans are lower exposure, you know? How are we thinking about this dropping mechanism right now? Is there, are enough beans going to come out at once? That's what we're uh, wondering. So the beans are going through here. Uh, it looks like a, like a narrower chute so that I could drop it into the funnel, like with a cup. Can I roll it? Rolling. Camera cuts. Robot is safe. Playback's coming up. Did we do it? Let's see. Yeah! What's the next thing we want to get? The next thing we want to do is this shot where we're like on a bed of coffee. We're using the macro lens to really scrape the bed, and then we want steam to come underneath it, as if like coffee is being roasted. Okay, and we're not just any macro lens, just so we can get that great perspective, we're using a probe lens, right? We're using a probe lens, and the movement should be simple enough where you get to take the reins to this one. What? <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that, but let's try, I guess. It's just like playing Call of Duty, right? All right, so this is a, we're gonna use a probe lens on this one. Um, a lot of you guys know this lens is uh, F14, mm -hmm. T14. Um, pretty tricky to light with, so we're definitely gonna probably be, if we're gonna do slow motion and T14, I'm probably gonna remove the light and just shoot the direct 1200 at it. I yeah. think that's how much light we're gonna need. So the next question is, why did we decide to backlight the coffee beans? Whenever you're really close up, you wanna see all the textures and the little details mm -hmm. in the textures and backlight really kind of creates that contrast yeah. to get all the textures. And we're so close up, we're so macro. So this is all texture. Let's call it a smoking gun. A smoking gun, yeah. got you it. You can also use this to make the cocktail. Okay, so using a smoking gun. We're just basically running the smoke and we're gonna run it right over the coffee beans right as we pull the camera back. The probe is like one of the hardest things to do because um, it can hit things really fast. Basically, we're gonna do, you're gonna take this keyframe. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna copy and paste it, maybe four seconds. Uh, okay, so that's four feet six inches. Oh, okay. So why don't we do, why don't we do like a foot? Okay. We're gonna test this. What do you usually say? Robot moves in three, two, one, action. <laughs> wow. It's pretty dope. Look look at this high yeah. level of skill. <laughs> I moved a line straight. <laughs> Does this help? Like having a background in editing, like it's. Basically, programming keyframes from one to the other uh, is. I mean, pretty much. It looks like you would edit things in After Effects. Like you're keyframing, you're adjusting your Bezier, and then the only thing is here, you're when you're doing your moves in 3D space, you have to adjust your arcs and stuff like that. But that's the it, the, the software does that a lot for you with the target tool and then just the focus offset. So ultimately, while you could mess anything up, it is a fairly straightforward process that just takes some time and effort to learn. 
Yeah, let's have Brandon roll it too. Okay, we're gonna roll. <laughs> and go ahead. Okay, robot moves in three, two, one, action. I mean, this is what, this is the mythical thing that people are trying to get often, you know, it's like. Now, would it look just as good slower or what, what, what do you say to that? It looks more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're in another world. So everything you do to make it not feel real, yeah. you know, it, it just takes you to another place. This is the real oh, thing. Oh, okay, this is the real thing? This is the real oh, thing. Oh no, this is a lot of pressure, okay. Okay, robot moves in three, two, one, action. Well, I'm glad that we were able to end on that shot. It was my personal favorite of the three because I did it single-handedly. No one else helped at all. <laughs> but in all seriousness, we pulled off some three really cool shots today. But us being here, that's a wrap. We're done. Woo! Woo! Now it's time to clean up though, so I gotta bounce. <laughs> so Nate, I have one last question for you. We've covered a lot of high-end concepts today. We dealt with a lot of high-end tools, some expensive camera robots, some expensive cameras, but ultimately, what can all the indie filmmakers take away from the lessons that we talked about today um, and use it and put it to use in their own studios and their own shoots? I think the takeaway is you don't have to know the look before you start. If you can dial and move and change things as you go, you can like feel into the shot and your tools can even affect your concept and your process can affect the end result. And so if you just let yourself stay loose, change a bunch of settings, dim up and down, just explore as you go, you'll discover something you weren't planning on. And that's, in my opinion, like the best stuff. Yeah, because we talked about that a little bit, right? Not everything has to be pre-planned. Everything for you starts out as just a rough draft on set, change some settings and see what happens. Yeah, I think don't be afraid to just, don't be afraid to not know where you're shooting. Uh, turn on a camera, it can look bad, feel it out, hold it handheld, just move the light around, pan, just, just try things. And I think like the more you try things, the more accidents will happen, the more discovery you'll be, and the reality is nobody really knows what they want until they see it. So start with a rough draft, try it, change it, and build towards your final image. Well, thank you for teaching us so much about product cinematography, and I hope you had a fun time getting to use the Lightstorm 1200D Pro. Where can people find you on social media and learn a little bit more about Miss Robot and what you do? Well, we're based in LA, so you guys can just come by, search us on Google, we'll be there. Um, and on social media, we're Miss underscore Robot. Okay, you can see a lot of cool stuff there. They have an amazing library of product cinematography, so definitely check them out and get inspired. Thanks for tuning in again, and we'll see you later.